My name is Carol John Cow. I'm with the Peace Resource Center of San Diego, and we've been one of the partners with the group that has been working to shut down San Onofre, which we were all very successful in. So let's give ourselves a big hand. I would really like to welcome you here today on behalf of all the organizations that work so hard on this, because this was a real victory of people power. And I believe that many of you here in the room were a part of that people power. And we're going to need to continue that people power to deal with this nuclear waste issue and to make sure that the decommissioning goes faster and does what we want it to do, not what Southern California Edison wants it to do. And we're going to need to be out there. And you are a part of that. This was a really great victory for us. And I just want to ask, how many of you actually came to some of the seminars, wrote letters, made phone calls? Yeah. Great. Well, pat yourselves on the back because you were part of that whole movement. And I love what Marvin said about welcome to the anti-nuclear renaissance. Here we are. We're still going. So let's shut them down. Let's shut down all of them. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we learned, well, let me, let me phrase this a different way. I, I changed what I was going to say. but. Um, when we were working to get it shut down, we were very focused on that and very hopeful, but at the same time, a little surprised what had happened, <laughs> you know, in June. And so when we turned our attention away from trying to get it closed and stopped looking at the steam generator questions and all of that, we became very focused on what needs to happen now. And one of those issues that we've been hearing about and why you, you are here is to talk about the nuclear waste, what its impact is, how we can get rid of it, what we can do to do that. And as many of us have said, it's as high now as it ever will be. It will start degrading, but it's still going to be there. So this is a very important time for us. The reason that we are presenting this symposium today is to educate you, to motivate you, and to activate you. We're going to have, at the end, a panel on where do we go from here, next steps. And we'll be talking about how we, as Southern California residents, can come together and keep going to deal with this nuclear waste issue. So I welcome you for being here. I hope you will stay to the end and take part in that panel discussion. We'll be talking, but we want to hear your ideas, too. So thank you for being here. We are very fortunate today to have Tony Eisman with us, who is going to uh, well, be the MC, the mistress of ceremonies. And she has been an outspoken opponent of San Onofre for over 30 years. Awesome. Awesome. Tony has served for 15 years on the Laguna Beach City Council, including three terms as mayor. She worked as an academic and personal counsel at Orange Coast Colleges and worked to, served two, twi two twice as academic Senate, pre Senate president. She's also been on the uh, Coastal Commission. Are you still on the California Coastal Commission? How long did you serve? Good for you, thank you, thank you. So we thank Tony for her service, we thank her for speaking out against San Onofre, and we welcome her today as your Mistress of Ceremony. So we'll bring Tony up. And keep reminding yourself, we're the ones that are gonna do it, we did it. Nobody's gonna do it but us, and so we need to talk about how to expand that community and keep going, thank you. You know, when I walked in today, I knew I'd see a lot of familiar faces. And we don't know each other's names, but we all know each other because we've sat in rooms year after year and fought the good fight. And who knew that we would wake up one morning and open up our computers and get the email <laughs> that it was closed. It still gives me goosebumps. Uh, if you watch, if you went to those meetings and 
Uh, body language says a lot. And if you looked at the uh, people from Edison, uh, it was pretty clear that something was really wrong because month after month, you could see the level of discomfort increase. And so for all those months, they said there's nothing wrong. And now they're pointing fingers <laughs> at someone else because there is something wrong. Uh, we, we have an interesting situation. And as relieved as we all were and thrilled as we are, all were, you know, now the work begins. And so we're very lucky today to have a, a distinguished panel. Uh, if you were here for the press conference, uh, I, I can't imagine that there's a question that can't be answered today by the experts that are here. Um, first, I want to introduce Dr. Arjan Ma Don. Oh, good. I know Don. I'll start with Don. Uh, Dr. Don Mosier. Uh, he and I have something in common. We both serve on a city council, and I would like him to move to Laguna Beach so he could be on ours. Yeah. There, the city of Del Mar is very lucky to have Dr. Mosier. Uh, his day job is at Scripps Research Institute. He's a member of the Department of Immunology and has been a long-term student of the effects of radiation. And so, Dr. Mosier. Thank you, Tony. We need to launch the PowerPoint. This is a 12-slide PowerPoint presentation. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to comment. OK. My presentation is in color. Your presentation is in black and white in color. That's weird. OK. Could I have the next slide, please? So I'm here to answer questions about radiation and cancer risk. And I'm going to address two key questions. The first is, is any radiation dose safe? Now, currently we think of their safe limits of radiation and then their dangerous levels of radiation. And I'm going to try to convince you that there's no safe level of radiation. Any level of radiation is dangerous. And having answered that question, I'm going to try to explain briefly why all the new information we've gathered, particularly in the last five years, allows us to understand why very low doses of radiation cause cancer, okay? This is a standard uh, table of radiation exposure and risk that comes from the International Atomic Energy Commission. It hasn't really changed much in 20 years. And uh, what it says at the, at the top uh, in red and orange are, are lethal doses of radiation. Uh, and they're all in a radiation dose called a millisievert. Uh, that's an absorbed dose of radiation. And if you get 10,000 millisieverts, you're dead. Uh, if you get 1,000, um, you're going to get sick or you may get cancer, but you'll survive. More importantly, if you go down this table, uh, maximum radiation levels recorded at Fukushima plant we're about 400 millisieverts per hour. That means a two hour exposure with the approach uh, a very dangerous lethal level. Um, if you get down to the bottom of this chart, uh, it's, you get into areas where it's supposed to be safe. Right in the middle it says the lowest annual dose at which any increase in cancer is observed is 100 millisieverts per year, okay? The rest of this talk is gonna say that's dead wrong. That's a vast uh, overestimate of, uh, of what is associated with cancer risk. As you go down here, uh, you get into areas of how much, how many millisieverts uh, that the body receives when you get a CT scan. And that's generally in the range of somewhere between 20 to 60 millisieverts, and that's thought to be safe, except it's not and I'll show you why it's not. And you get way down at the bottom of the list, you get mammograms, 
that are thought to use only 0.4 millisieverts and were thought until recently to be safe, but are not. And at the very bottom of the list is a dental x-ray, which is only one five thousandths of a millisievert. Okay? How many people in this room have had a dental x-ray? How many people put on a lead apron? Why? Because the dentist has to put on a lead apron because that exposure is thought to be unsafe. Okay. Okay, thank you. So remember the lead apron because that's a very, very low dose of radiation compared to 100 millisieverts. So I want to talk about two studies that illustrate the risk of radiation. And the important thing about these two studies is we know the cancer incidence that results and the radiation exposure. And they're both very large studies. And that's important because these are the only two studies I could find that really have statistically significant data to show a relative risk of two, a doubling of risk of cancer. You need a lot of people who get cancer. So um, this first study is a 15 country collaborative study uh, of radiation workers in the nuclear industry. This is a European study. It was published in 2007. The important point is that they had over 400,000 nuclear industry workers and they were followed for an average of 12 years, okay? When you're exposed to radiation, your chief risk of cancer is 20 to 30 years out, okay? So a 12-year follow-up is really not that long. But because of the large number of, of uh, individuals followed, they were able to get a significant estimate of mortality uh, associated with increased exposure to radiation. And that's down at the bottom line. Uh, that elevated relative risk is really, would normally be expressed as 1.97. It's basically a two-fold increased risk of cancer in these nuclear industry workers. And in that cohort, at the time the study was closed, that dose of radiation accounted for 5,233 extra deaths, okay? And this is a 12-year follow-up. If it were 25-year follow-up, that number would likely double, okay? Now, these are, are individuals who, who, whose limit, annual limit of exposure is about 50 millisieverts, and yet you have an increased cancer incidence. So 100 millisieverts is not safe, 50 millisieverts is not safe. Now let's go to the next, um, let's try to go to the next. Can I have help with the next slide, please? Okay. This is a study that's even more impressive to me because it involves pediatric patients, kids. We know that children are more sensitive to radiation because they're growing faster, they have more dividing cells that increases the radiation sensitivity. In the last 10 years, there's been a lot more use of CT, computed tomography, to image uh, problems in children. And this is a, a technology that's very expensive, heavily subsidized by General Electric and, the, and manufacturers of CT units. And Recently, there have been a, a study that was just published this August that estimated the increased cancer risk associated with the introduction of computer tomography, and this looked over the past 10 years. What it found was that over the lifetime of these children exposed, there was about, sorry, that was my fault. Uh, there's 4,870 future cancers in, uh, predicted from these CT scans. If you read the small print, um, CT scans range from very low doses up to about 70 millisieverts per scan, and some of these individuals had uh, more than one scan. But if it could be limited to below 20 millisieverts, you'd eliminate some of the risk, but not all of the risk. 
So what that means is an exposure of, of children to 20 millisieverts has a very demonstrable cancer risk. So is any radiation dose safe? The answer is no. Exposures of less than 20 millisieverts lead to increased cancer risk. The risk is higher in children and in females, and that's because females have more active immune system and more dividing cells. And as I mentioned in this press conference, the Institute, National Institute of, of Medicine uh, recommendation to abandon mammograms that involve less than one millisievert per year in younger women is based on data showing that that exposure increases the risk of breast cancer. So I think the only conclusion is there is no safe dose of radiation. And I'm going to buttress that conclusion by telling you why the new knowledge we have from cancer genomics explains the impact of very low dose of radiation. So I'm going to talk about cancer genomics. We now have the ability to sequence the entire genome, all your DNA of every individual. And we do, in cancer genomics, what's done is you take a tumor and you take normal tissue from the same individual and you sequence all 30,000 genes in all the non-coding regions. So you sequence the entire genome. And then you compare the two and you see how many mutations, what's different in the tumor that, from the normal tissue. And these results show two things. One, there are mutations that are associated with cancer that are germline, that are inherited from your parents. And there are also somatic mutations that are acquired during your lifetime. So radiation exposure would occur during your lifetime and you'd have a, a cumulative burden of mutations from both sources. Uh, and the outcome of these studies, many of which are only a couple years old, is that each cancer has hundreds of mutations. There are some key mutations, often 6 to 12, that are known to cause cancer from other patients. But there are also a lot of individual specific mutations. And then there's a very much increased risk if you have inherited mutations, particularly for breast cancer uh, and lymphomas. So I'll go through that briefly in a minute. So I'm not sure you can see this, but this is how modern cancer genomics works. Uh, you sequence um, both the tumor and normal tissue. You get the germline genome that's present in, in all tissue. You get the things that are different in the cancer genome. You align those two and, and find out what the differences are. And then you go down at the end, you use that information to try to find out what caused this tumor, or are there any drugs that work against the mutations, um, and what are your treatment options. And two years ago, it, it cost about $5,000 and took about two days to generate a whole genome. Now it costs $1,000 and takes about three hours. And yet next year, it'll be half the price and twice as fast. So this information is advancing rapidly. This is a recent review from Science Magazine. Now this is an important slide because from all the cancer genome data, what we've learned is that most of the mutations associated with cancer are somatic. They are acquired during your lifetime. There are a few bad ones that are germline, but those are less than 20% of the total mutations associated with cancer. And what that means is you walk around your daily life, you're exposed to many different mutagens, Irradiation is one of those, but there's a cumulative effect, and the more of these somatic mutations you have, the more likely they are to be associated with a tumor. This is the hardcore science. Um, we used to think that when you're exposed to radiation, you've got a big DNA genome, and mutations happen randomly over the genome, and there's a certain risk. That's absolutely wrong. There are many hypersensitive sites that are exquisitely sensitive to low-dose radiation. And in the last year, we've begun to understand what those sites are. And basically, this says cancer mutations target epigenetic regulation. This is a uh, review from uh, Nature uh, Genetics uh, just last month. 
And I'm not going to go through the details, but DNA is not just a strand floating around your nucleus. It's all wrapped up in proteins called nucleosomes. It's covered, it's protected. But when it gets functional, it has to unwrap. And when it does that, it's highly sensitive to radiation. You've basically got naked DNA. And all the cancer mutations here cluster around regulatory genes that are at the start site of, of genes, at gene regulatory sites. So it's like you've got an old car, and everything is sort of beat up, but it still works because your accelerator and brakes work. When these mutations happen, they're almost all in things that equate to accelerator or brakes, and they're lethal mutations. 95% of these mutations are loss of function mutations. There are few gain of functions where your accelerator gets stuck on. Okay? But these are all in hypersensitive DNA regions. So what that means is, you say, why, you know, why are we so sensitive to very low dose of radiation? And that's because these regulatory genes, when they're functioning, are in hypersensitive sites that are exquisitely sensitive to radiation or other mutagenic events. And the rest of the genome doesn't matter so much. And that's probably why we arrive at those very high exposure levels without taking into account that there are special regions of the genome that are so sensitive to radiation. So well, this summarizes what I've just said, that active genes are much more sensitive to radiation damage. Regulatory genes are highly vulnerable. DNA repair genes are the most vulnerable if you have uh, mutations in genes that either detect DNA breaks or repair DNA breaks, you're in big trouble. And two of the best known inherited genes are BRCA1 and BRCA2 for breast cancer. Those are both re DNA repair mutations. So those are uh, reasons for hypersensitivity. And finally, I want to say if you've got a lot of mutations that contribute to cancer, and you've got a lot of mutations but you're not quite there, and you get one more mutation in a critical region, that's enough to tip the balance and drive cancer progression. And that's why the cumulative exposure to radiation is so dangerous. That last decay event that you encounter may be the mutation that drives your cancer. And finally, if cancer association mutations arise in many insults from smoking and, and environmental uh, toxins, why add one more insult that we can control? We can control exposure to radiation. Some of the other things are much more difficult to control. So I want to conclude by saying that genes associated with cancer are much more sensitive to radiation damage than other regions of the human genome, something we didn't know a few years ago. It's something that is not taken into account in our current exposure standards. There's a cumulative effect of all mutagenic agents so all these mutations you incur over a lifetime just pile up. And then, uh, as we know, age is a risk for cancer. The, the older you are, the more of these mutations you incur. And that explains why there's no safe level of radiation exposure. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about this. And I hope I didn't get into any hardcore science that was too difficult for you. Thank you. My name is Miki Bei. I'm living in Irvine, but I'm also from Japan. And I have a question. I have a question about the uh, radiation dose for the uh, children, because uh, after 311, the Japanese government government they have changed the, the uh, regulation, the law for the uh, um, radiation dose to the nation from one millisievert per year to 20 millisievert. And still lots of lots of children are living in the uh, highly contaminated area in Japan. As an expert, I have a question. Do you urge Japanese children to move away from Fukushima? Because um, I, I, I know the regulations in Japan, and I think that 20 millisievert uh, level is is too high. 
And so I, I think that's a mistake. Uh, in this study of pediatric uh, exposure to CT scans, 20 millisieverts was still associated with about 50% uh, of the maximum risk of cancer incidence. And uh, a much safer level would be one millisievert. Okay. Right? Uh, there's a little bit of difference between a CT scan where you're getting the whole dose in a short period of time in, in 30 minutes or so compared to 20 millisieverts per year when you don't know what that is, but that's still a cumulative risk uh, of 20 millisieverts, and I think that was a very unwise decision. I agree. Thank you. I wonder if you have anything to say about the uh, low energy scanners that they want us to go through in the airport. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know the uh, dose level of radiation uh, on those scanners, but uh, don't fly too often or run through them. <laughs> Yes, you spoke about there being specific gene sites that were far more vulnerable to creating cancer. Is there, or could you explain, a correlation between what those gene sites are and where they show up in the human body? Well, the genes are expressed in every cell, but the, the genes that are particularly sensitive are the genes that regulate the start of, of gene transcription, of, of copying genes and also the genes that are responsible for detecting DNA damage and DNA repair. So those are in every cell of the body. Uh, they're more active in rapidly dividing cells. So one of the cancers that's associated with radiation exposure are leukemias and lymphomas, and those are derived from white blood cells that divide rapidly. So when you divide rapidly, there's a consequence. You've got a shorter time to duplicate your DNA for the daughter cell, but you've also got a shorter time to repair it. And so rapid division correlates with increased sensitivity to radiation. But this is, these genes are in every cell. They may not be on or off in every cell, but they're, they, these are fundamental genes for, for all uh, cells in the body. Hi, my name is Yoko Kubota. I'm from Japan, a documentary filmmaker. Um, there are already a confirmed case of 43 children that are diagnosed for thyroid cancer in Fukushima uh, based on a 48% of the study, the population study. Now, uh, the realistically, there are so many Fukushima, um, peop uh, the people that live in Fukushima, they cannot get out from the prefecture because of simply the economical reason. Now, is there any suggestion from you that what can they do to protect from this uh, radiation? Well, uh, thyroid cancer following radiation is, is, is uptake of uh, radioactive iodine in the thyroid. The thyroid function depends on iodine. Um, and the protective uh, action after a nuclear event is to, is to take cold iodine, iodine pills, to try to prevent the uptake of the radioactive iodine in the environment. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, everybody has to have iodine pills ready to take because you have to take them before exposure. Once the radioactive iodine gets absorbed into the thyroid gland, it's too late. There is an increased risk of thyroid cancer associated uh, with uptake of, of I-131. And uh, in the Three Mile Island, incidence, there is a downstream increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer uh, 20 to 25 years later. It takes a while to show up. So if there's iodine uptake because of the Fukushima disaster in children, you wouldn't expect to see those thyroid cancers, the incidence rise above the background level again for, uh, for 20 years or so. So I, I've heard, you know, people say, well, there's no cancer risk going up. You don't know the cancer risk is going up until the excess cases start showing up and you're going to have to wait 20 to 30 years to make that determination. Where are we most likely to be exposed uh, from, is there likely exposure coming from Fukushima for us here in our daily life? The exposure in Fukushima, most of it is sort of passed over. There's not a, a lot left. Uh, you know, there were cesium traces here on the west coast, but uh, there's cesium and, and bluefin tuna that circulate around. Those are pretty low levels, and they're sort of dropping off a little bit of time. Cesium has a, a very long half-life, so those fish will be radioactive. But um, the, 
currently the level of reactivity in bluefin tuna is not so high that you should avoid eating them entirely. I wouldn't eat too many of them, but it's pretty low. The problem with radioactivity is illustrated by the fish problem, though, because there's food chain concentration. So you get, you know, there's a lot of cesium offshore of Fukushima right now, and the little fish get contaminated, and the big fish get contaminated, and the tuna come along, and they get contaminated. They all concentrate the radionuclide. So I don't think there's a big risk from Fukushima right now, but the risk has not diminished one iota since the incident. There's continued release of radioactivity from Fukushima, so we have to remain vigilant. Could it get worse as those fish migrate and have consumed and then come back? I think we should continue to monitor that. There's only been two studies I know of, and the radioactivity has been pretty constant in the fish here on the west coast, but in Japan, the radioactivity in the fish 15 miles offshore is still going up. So it's something to watch. And my related question to that, where can I go to find uh, current levels of radiation and field research on these kinds of things? I can't seem to find that kind of stuff online. <laughs> the resource I use is PubMed. That's the National uh, Library of Medicine. And um, if you put in, if you use search terms like radioactive fish or Fukushima, you'll come up with tons of articles, at least 1% of which are informative. <laughs> uh, first, is uh, California milk still radioactive? Because I know they had studies showing it was. And two, where can we get copies of your slides? Okay, Donna says the slides are on the website, and uh, those are for consumption. Um, there have been times when California milk is, shows radioactivity, and I don't know the most current data, so I really am not prepared to answer that question. I know that the milk consumption from cows in Scotland has resumed in the last year following the Chernobyl incident, so at, at least Scottish milk might be safe. <laughs> I've read a couple articles about uh, an alternative to mammograms called thermography, and it's supposed to be pretty safe, and then if, if there's problems with a the thermograph image or whatever, then, uh, then one suggests going the mammogram route to see exactly what's going on. But but have you heard about thermography and do you think that's it? I've heard about it, but I, I really uh, don't have the expertise to comment on the relative resolution of thermography versus uh, mammography. Um, there, is a, there is an issue um, that makes the current way uh, mammography is done a little problematic for women, and that, that is that during the imaging, the breast is compressed. If you have very early stage ductal cancer in the breast, that exam can cause uh, the cancer to spread. And so any alternative uh, that avoids that pressure would be good. And I don't know enough details about thermography to know whether that avoids that procedure or not. Could you comment about how low uh, level radiation gets into the uh, environment in active nuclear power plants? and second in decommissioning ones like ours? Well, uh, one of the problems I have uh, with dealing with the radiation radius in San Onofre is we really don't have good data on uh, when the reactivity is released and, and where it gets concentrated. Um, there are spikes of tritium release uh, occasionally during operations, um, and that does get concentrated uh, in the food chain and in the water, um, but we don't have good exposure levels. Uh, in the data that's available from the NRC. Um, the risk during the decommissioning process is going to be maintaining the uh, pool storage safely and uh, maintaining these dry casts that really aren't designed to store fuel for more than 20 years. And when it's high burnout fuel, they probably won't even last 20 years. So when you talk about real catastrophes at San Onofre, we're going to be exposed to very high doses of radiation that are going to be very dangerous. And I think that's what we need to focus on. We need to, to prevent any kind of disaster there while we're waiting for the uh, slow radioactive decay of the fuel rods on site. What about if they demolish the domes? The domes are, are protected devices for, uh, for, for meltdown of the reactor core. Uh, once the reactor core is cold, the, the domes are uh, just decoration. 
they absorb gases, don't they? The concrete? Microphone, Roger. Uh, the question was, do, do the, the domes retain re radioactivity and release them, or is there a danger when they break down the concrete? And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe one of the co-panelists can answer that. And we thank you for all the good questions and, and the attention. Does anybody know what a sponge was? Yeah. A sponge was a surfer or some dude that was looking for money that they would bring in and they'd put in the plant and pay them an inordinate amount of money for two to four minutes of work. And it really sounded like a good idea, right? But we don't know where they are. And I think it would be really interesting if you have some old surfer friends that are probably like 60 something and say, did any of your buddies get a lot of money for working at San Onofre? If they're still alive, I think it'd be interesting to study them, so it's a, just a consideration. Um, the next amazing member of our, our panel is Marvin Resnikoff, and he has been an associate, senior associate of radioactive waste management and, and an international consultant on radioactive waste management. He's a principal manager and a project director and, and has been doing this since 1974. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I used to get my feet x-rayed. It was a lot I got my feet x-rayed. And you know, you go to the shoe store with your friends and, and you get to look at the bones in your feet and you're 10 years old and that's the coolest thing you've ever seen. I have really small feet. I don't know if anything happened, but we have come a long ways. Now that was 1950 something. But it, I imagine that what we're going to hear is that we have come a long ways since 1974. Uh, Dr. Reznikoff uh, conducted a study for concerned citizens of Manitoba regarding transportation of a radiated fuel. I'm sure that would be an, a high interest to us in hopes that maybe there will be a transport. And his research on low level commercial and military waste. We are very lucky to have him here. He's written four books and has been uh, a speaker for President Obama on nuclear safety. Marvin Resnikoff. Well, thanks for all coming. Um, first, a personal note. I got started on this uh, working for Attorney General Lefkowitz in New York State in 1974, um, investigating shipments of plutonium out of Kennedy Airport. They were actually shipping liquid plutonium out of Kennedy Airport. and. Uh, in containers that were designed to withstand a 30-foot drop. Uh, so we took the, the Attorney General took uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to court. Uh, it was our opinion, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, it was our opinion that uh, this was unsafe, uh, that planes fly higher than 30 feet, uh, but the NRC uh, disputed that, uh, I don't know how, and eventually, eventually, uh, by 1980, uh, Congress passed an appropriations bill that said you have to design these uh, plutonium containers so they could withstand an air crash, just like black boxes on airplanes uh, can withstand an air crash, and they did. Uh, I only mention this story because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't have all the answers, okay? You have to feel, when you ask a question and there's a table full of suits, uh, they don't necessarily have all the answers to your questions. And they didn't have it in, uh, when we talked about plutonium uh, flying out of Kennedy Airport. Another example is 
1976, I gathered together four engineering students, and this is how I got started on <coughs> uh, decommissioning. I gathered four engineering students at SUNY Buffalo, where I was teaching, and I don't know what got into me. I said, we should go look at what's happening at some of these experimental reactors that they're closing down, like the Elk River reactor. Uh, and we looked at it, and we saw that, uh, well, there's some radionuclides that look like they're long-lived. Uh, and it doesn't look like what the industry says, that we can just entomb the reactor and wait for 300 years and then just take it apart. It doesn't look like that is true. Uh, so we published a paper on that and got tremendous heat. You know, it was almost like, you know, being on a diving board and leaping off and hoping there's water in the pool. Uh, we got a tremendous heat from the, the engineering department, the nuclear engineering department. But, and uh, I'm sure Arjun would agree about this, the industry never tells you you're right, you know, when you, when you uh, are right. But in 1982, Science Magazine said we changed the entire course of decommissioning in the country uh, because no, they are no longer talking about entombing reactors. Now it's either safe store, 60 years, not 300, or this immediate dismantlement of reactors. Uh, that's just another example I've learned. Uh, you just don't take you know, authority. You can ask questions. They don't necessarily have all the answers. The, the industry doesn't. <clears throat>